are going to speak out of a passage of scripture that I think is a lot of the times it's quoted in part, but it's rarely looked at as a whole. And we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, and we're going to preach through probably about um, like probably 11 or so verses, if that's okay. We're just going to go verse by verse and just look at this passage of Scripture because I think it's one of the most powerful passages of, of Scripture we have. Um, and it's one of the best. Uh, Paul's my, one of my favorite, obviously. Uh, Jesus is, what he says is, you know, the pinnacle we love. But Paul, in terms of authorship and the way he writes is, is amazing because it makes sense to me. Paul's a logician. And, uh, and Jesus was a logician. I, I kind of, the narrative that Christians shouldn't use their brain is a bad narrative. Um, in fact, we should be the smartest people that walk the face of the planet because we are connected to God himself in Jesus' name, right? We should access the way he thinks, the way he, the way he talks, the way he, you know, the, the logic he uses. And so Paul has great logic in this. And that's why I love it because it just makes sense. You know, when I did um, intermediate math growing up, which means I wasn't good at math. So I was in the intermediate class where you could take like a, take it slower, you know. We had a lot of stoners in my class, basically. It was me and all the stoners. Drug deals were happening. I was like, what is going on? I grew up in a Christian school, didn't understand it. But when math finally made sense in my stoner intermediate class, something was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. That's how this passage of scripture made me feel when I was studying it. Like, oh, I get it. I get what Paul was saying. Like I said, it's quoted quite a bit, but we're going to start in verse, uh, verse 11, and then we're going to go back a little bit, and then we're going to go forward, if that's okay. Verse 11 says this, therefore, say therefore. therefore. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but we are giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about the outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For we are beside ourselves, which he's, he's saying this, if we are beside ourselves, it's for God. What he's saying is, if I'm crazy to you, it's because it's for God. If you think I'm crazy, it's not for you. It's for God anyway. So you think I'm crazy. And he's like, if I'm in my right mind, it's for you. So if I'm actually acting not crazy, it's so I can be more palatable to you is what he's saying. It's like, so for all of our super spiros who like to take off their shoes, that verse is for you, right? If I seem crazy, it's for God, right? I, I take my shoes off, not for you, right? Um, I put them back on for you in Jesus' name. Put them on for me. <laughs> for we, if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind it is for you. Um, and he says this, Christ controls us because we have concluded this. Get, get his conclusion. That one has died for all, therefore all have died. And, if, and he died for all, that those who live might, not, might, might no longer live for themselves. Hello. But for him who for their sake died and was raised. So he says this, this is my conclusion that since Christ died, I died with him. And since he died for me, I no longer live for me. I live for him because he was dead and he was buried and he was raised again. I can't live for myself. This whole chapter is all about reconciliation. So the title of my talk is The Recipe for Reconciliation. How do we bring about reconciliation? Uh, the church in Corinth was an absolute disaster. It was a dumpster fire. It was just everything that could go wrong went wrong in Corinth. Uh, Paul wrote his first letter because there was a leader in the church who was, they, they were practicing sexual promiscuity. They were worshiping pagan idols. He was, they were entering it in. And then that leader started going against Paul and his leadership and what he was preaching and the gospel. It was crazy. There was dissension. There was disunity. It was just an absolute mess. So Paul writes a letter to them. He brings harsh correction. If you think that 1 Corinthians is harsh, it's because it is. It was meant to be harsh. It was bringing correction. And then what you had was they, they responded well at first, but then over time they started drifting back to their old ways. And then some voices came back in and started creating disunity again. And Paul's in prison and he's hearing that Corinth is back to being crazy. Paul, they're back at it again. And so he actually wrote, there's a lost letter to Corinth that we, that, that we kind of hear. He references in 2 Corinthians that it was actually even more harsh than 1 Corinthians. So he starts out 2 Corinthians saying, hey, I'm sorry I had to be so harsh. I'm sorry I had to kind of crack the whip. 
it, but you guys are crazy. And he starts bringing it back and whole centering around in 2 Corinthians, he's talking about how he's restored his relationships, how he forgives those who have come against them or he's, they've slandered his name and they've come against them. And he begins to write to them and reminding them that, hey, you know what? My joy, he talks about the joys and the pains of ministry. He's, rec- he's reconciled with people. He's healed. And he talks about the joys. And you know what the pains were in ministry? People. <laughs> the church in Corinth, they were the pain in his neck, right? They're like, I have the joys of the, of the power of God moving through him, the joy of healing the world, the joy of discipling people, the joy of what was to come, the joy of heaven, the joy of eternity. But the pain was that the fact that he had to be alive dealing with them right now. He's like, yeah, you're a pain in my neck. Doesn't that make you feel better, right? People are kind of a pain. But people are also his purpose. See, Paul is sitting here writing about people. Why didn't he just give up? He he had so many other churches, but he continued to pursue people who were running from him because he understood something greater was at work. So not only was it the pain of that, but it was the joy of what was to come. And he's writing this book when he's had a recent brush with death. Everybody know about Paul's life? He almost died a lot. You were like, whoa, dude, you have some intercessors praying for you because every time you get close to dying, something stops it. So he's this recent brush with death, but when you know you have a brush with death, you start thinking about what's next. So Paul has had this brush with death and he starts to begin to ponder on and to think about what comes next. And so in this chapter, in chapter five, he begins to say, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Because he's thinking about what's next. He's thinking about, hey, I don't have to deal with this forever. But, there, but I'm dealing with it now for a reason. And he finishes this right before we started in verse 11. Look at verse 9 and 10. He looks at this, he says, So whether we are at home or we are away, make it our aim to please him. For we all, say all, all. we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is his due. For what he has done in the body, whether good or for evil. Paul concludes this, that the reason why he keeps going, the reason why he keeps pursuing them, the reason, the reason why he keeps trying to pastor them, the reason why that, the fact that he is living and he is breathing and he's continuing to pursue Jesus and continuing to do what God has called him to do because he understands this concept. Every single one of us will one day face our creator before the judgment seat. And Christ himself will examine our life and will look at whether it were good or the bad and he will begin to determine whether we will receive a reward or we suffer loss. And the loss that we suffer is the realization that there were things in my life that I did that were not unto the Lord. He says this in 1 Corinthians. He says that everything you do on this earth will be tested by fire, whether it's wood, hay, or straw, or gold, silver, or precious stones. And it will be tested by fire and whatever remains, you can bring with you. And so some of you will be tested by fire and nothing will be left and you will get into heaven. And I'd like to paraphrase it, but barely. So you can make it into heaven empty-handed by how we live on this earth. And he's saying, this is to believers. He's saying, all of us will face the judgment seat of Christ. And then he begins to kind of this passage on reconciliation, but it's prefaced before the understanding of we are living for something greater and outside of this world. The life we live matters because God himself will examine it. The life and what we do with what God has given us matters. And so then he starts talking about reconciliation. Reconciliation is this. It's to make what used to be an enemy now a friend. So what you used to be opposed to, now it's working, you're working with it. So how do we reconcile? We all have things that we need to reconcile with in life. It could be we need to reconcile with the spouse. It could be reconciled with family. It could be reconciled with people in the church, church hurt, whatever it may be. But there are things that God has called us to reconcile with, to rectify with. And that doesn't mean that we always be, get the last word in or we are right. What we are saying is I am living with eternity in mind and I'm not going to allow things to be unsettled here on earth. But through the spirit of God, I'm going to begin to reconcile reconcile the things that God's asked me to reconcile. And he gives us this recipe, whether we read 
whether we need reconciliation in, in these different areas of life, there's a key word, a key phrase that connects all of this together. And it's the word, therefore. Say, therefore. Therefore, therefore appears four different times in these passages of Scripture. In every verse that we read, we're going to see the word, therefore, which means this. As result of. As a result of this, this is why we do this. So when he talks about being before the judgment seat of Christ and everything being examined before Christ, then he says, therefore, knowing. So he says, as a result of understanding, we will face Christ. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others to be known and hope that you are also known in your conscience. And he finishes that, therefore, with saying that the one who has died, therefore, all have died. And if he has died for all those who live, might not lo- might, may no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died and was raised. This is the key to living a life of reconciliation. He's kind of laying the framework. Number one, we have to understand one day we will face Jesus. Number two, that while we are here on this earth, we can no longer live for ourselves. Reconciliation is impossible when we live a selfish life. And so he's saying, okay, if Christ has died and rose again, it's the new framework, right? Christ began this by giving up his life, defeating death, hell, and the grave, but not staying dead. And he resurrected back to life. And now this recipe begins to happen. And so the first thing that will change when we understand this, he's saying the first thing you have to understand about reconciliation is it will change your outlook. It says this in verse 16. It says, from now on, therefore... We regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. As a result of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, we have a new way to understand the world. Regard means this. It means to understand or to know. Okay, So we no longer understand things according to the flesh, according to the world standards, which means we no longer understand things to the subjective reality of our feelings, our desires, our, 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 our gender, our socioeconomic class, these different things that are subjective, which means this, they can change depending on who the person is. So th- there was a subjective understanding of who Christ would be before Christ came. Different groups thought the Messiah would look a different way. And what he's saying is because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ himself, we now have an objective truth in which we can see the world, and that is Christ and Christ crucified. We can have a new framework, a new outlook, a new way of looking at life. A worldview is built on three simple frameworks. It's who created you, what went wrong, and how do we fix it? The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ himself answers all of those questions. Number one, God himself became flesh, dwelt among us, and died for us. And so the one who created us took the punishment that we deserve. And the problem was sin. The problem wasn't just I'm a bad person. The problem is I have no way of being good. And he dealt with the problem. And now he says, okay, now that I've dealt with the problem and I've given you, this is how we're going to fix it. And his name is Jesus. And so we have a new outlook. We have a new framework that is, that is bigger and greater than our present re- reality. If we are no longer going to live for ourselves, we have to change the lens in which we interpret the world. I believe the reason why most of us are selfish, myself included, is because we look through a lens that only is subjective to how I experienced that thing. How did I receive it? How did I feel? What was my desire? What was this? What was my craving? And when we look at the lens of that instead of the new lens that has been made available to us through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, what happens is we don't actually see people for who they really are. We don't see our mission for what God has called us to, to do. There's ways to understand the physical reality of humanity, and it's a new and better way of understanding the kingdom of God and, and understanding the kingdom of this world, and it's through the lens of what God is building to come. Because how many of you know we have the kingdom of God now, the already and the not yet? So the lens we now look through is not just towards what's coming, but we actually look through what's coming. We look through the kingdom of God and the reality that God is building here on this earth and we can see a different lens and understanding. If that's what God is building, I'm gonna help join that because my new outlook has changed. I'm no longer regarding things just to the flesh and how I receive it on the flesh, but I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to open up my outlook to see something from the perspective of the new kingdom of God in which he's building now. 
The second thing that begins to happen is we get a new order. So first we have to get a new outlook. We have to get a new lens and then we get a new order. It says this, therefore, say therefore. Therefore. There's that word again. And result of, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All, is, uh, all, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that is in Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. To be in Christ is to participate in a new creation, is a new way of living in the kingdom of God now. Christ did not just die to get us into heaven. He died to get heaven into us. He died that in this present reality, we can have the kingdom of heaven real and and tangible in our lives where we are transformed from the inside out. See, what is it to know that Christ died for you? What is it to know that Christ was buried and rose again without having the revelation of what was the result of that death, burial, and resurrection? It wasn't just that you could feel better about your eternity. It's that it could make you into a new being itself from the inside out. And from the inside out flows life change. From the inside out flows different ways of thinking, different ways of speaking, different ways of acting. But we are a new creation. See what I said about this chapter? We have heard this all the time. People will quote different parts of the scripture without realizing Paul was building a case all together. It's all connected. We have to understand that our new creation comes from a kingdom and from the God in which we will face. And depending on how much we allow that new creation to flow through us, God will look at our life and say, hey, I offered you the world. I offered you a new life. I offered you a new way of thinking, a new way of living. Yet you chose something that was old and dead and crazy. And I said, hey, this is a new life for you. This is what we have at our disposal. And so what is it that we know of these things, but we don't have a new way of living that's brought forth? We must begin to reorder our lives around the God in which we serve. And we can no longer live for ourselves. But when you have a new order and who you serve and you begin to center your life about God worship and, and God sac- and sacrificing to him, not self-worship and self-sacrifice and self-righteousness, but God's righteousness and God's grace and who God is, what begins to happen, what flows forth is a new way of living. And this new way of living begins to carry some new weight with the world. Because he says that we have been entrusted with this message of reconciliation. So we can live out in such a way that the world takes notice. Maybe our message doesn't carry as much weight, not because our God doesn't, but because the people that are carrying the message don't live out the message they say that they have. So he says it's a message of reconciliation. That we have been made enemies of God to being friends of God, yet we live in a way that's exactly like those who are enemies of God. And that we are expecting that this message of good news will be displayed through filthy lives. But the message is best displayed in a transformed life from those who receive it. That as my life is transformed, the message of reconciliation becomes a lot more appealing. As not just our life individually is transformed, but as our communities are transformed, as we deal with conflict, as we come together from different backgrounds, different economic classes, different races, different genders, we all come together and yet we are unified and we work through conflict and we build and we are, they're, they're, we're stronger together. People are going to look at that and say, whoa, what is going on? That message of reconciliation carries weight when it's otherworldly. When we live outside of this world... We have been given a new creation that is otherworldly, that is outside of this space, outside of this time. And imagine our communities, if we did that together, City Church, imagine what Ventura would look at. Imagine what Ventura would say. See, I think the problem is, I think the reason why people are choosing to disengage from church and choosing to have individualized, privatized spirituality where we just go online, we hear a message, we do our worship, we do my message, and I do my devotions, and I don't need anyone else, is because the problem is the message of reconciliation is not at work within the church. We have come here to be converted and to get into heaven, but we have not allowed heaven to invade our space and to invade our community where God begins to transform us from the inside out. 
And it's in this transformed way of living and doing community that the world takes notice and we have been entrusted with a message that God says, the weight in which you live will begin to have the world take notice of something is different about that community. It's not individualized, privatized spirituality. It's not just me and God. It's something greater and deeper. See, the reason why people are important because people cause the most pain. Man, it would be easy to serve Jesus if I was just in a monastery, not talking to anyone. It's me and Jesus. Got my hymns, got my Bible, and I got to talk to nobody. But that's the whole point. See, we may not be growing in God because we may not have enough people that's causing enough friction in our life to realize the areas that have not been transformed. Well, I can't go to that church because they just get on my nerves. Good reconcile with them. Why are they getting on your nerves? What's being revealed in you? What's being revealed in me? That God is saying, let me, let me, let me, let me transform that. That's why marriage is likened to our relationship with God. Because who presses your buttons more than your spouse? Because you're around each other all the time. It's not that you don't love each other. It's just like, whoa, can you just, you know, Nancy's like, can you just put the socks in the basket? Can you put the dishes in the dishwasher? I'm like, I got you. And then I forget. You know, and I feel bad. It's, it's genuine. I genuinely want to. <laughs> hey, can you pick up this at the store? For sure. They start talking to someone at church about spiritual things, you know. And I get home. She's like, did you get that? I did not. <laughs> but I will. It causes friction, it causes tension, it causes, not because it's that person's bad, but it's actually the way that God designed life and that we do it together. So the message of reconciliation is only lived out in community. We cannot actually live out a, a message if you're not reconciling with people. I heard the story of this woman and she had endured and survived the Holocaust. And she got radically transformed and saved in that process. She met Jesus and she was preaching in uh, Western Europe and she was in a church. And after the service, a man comes up to her and he says, you may not know me, but I was an SS officer at the concentration camp in which you were living at. And I'm sorry, will you please forgive me? And he rose out, he put out his hand and instead of shaking his hand, she gave him a hug. And she says, I don't have a choice not to. Of course I forgive you. That is the message of reconciliation. To the height of evil in humanity, there is no space or place that has justified unforgiveness, justified bitterness. We are called to reconcile with anybody and everybody because that's our message. The second thing, or the, the, the second thing was order. The first one was outlook. And this is where the keys can come on up. But the third thing is what's the outcome? You know, if you're a business person, you're results driven. Um, what's the ROI? What's the return on investment? So if I do this, what's going to happen? I'm glad you asked that. Because that is important to understand. There is something that will begin to happen. So when you get a new outlook, therefore, then you get a new reorder and you realize, okay, my life is now centered around and, 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 and worshiping God. And from that, this new life is coming. But then this is the outcome is another therefore. Second Corinthians 5.20 says, therefore, say therefore. therefore. We are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Ambassador means to, to be representative of, to act on behalf of. Christ had to come because we needed a perfect representation of what it means to be who God has called us to be. Sin came into the world and messed that up. We are created in the image of God, the Imago Dei. We are created not just in his natural image or physical image, but to, to be those, when it says the image bearers, is to be the representatives of. So humans were created to be ambassadors on this earth to the God who was in the spiritual realm. And sin messed it up, didn't it? We became bad representatives of God. 
so selfish and self-serving and sin just is a disease that grows and grows and grows and only can be dealt with with a perfect blood sacrifice. So what happened was we became bad representatives. And so in the commandments, when it says, do not take the Lord's name in vain, it doesn't just mean don't say this certain phrase, you know? So we're like, gosh, darn it. I didn't say it, (laughs) right? Like, yeah, don't cuss. I'm not like advocating for like swearing. But what I'm saying is there's something deeper to that, taking the Lord's name in vain. What it means really, if you look at it in the original language is don't misrepresent God. So if you've met God and you know God and you know God is good and God is faithful and God is gracious and God is consistent, then please don't misrepresent him to others. Because that is of our highest calling is to be ambassadors of God to live on behalf of God. So Christ came on this earth and it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So he lives among us. He's tempted on every way. He says he's a good high priest. Why? Because he was tempted on every way, yet he did not give in. He's the exact imprint of God's word and God's deed and God's image. If you want to know who God is, it's Jesus. And he was perfect and he lived it out. And he's a perfect sinless sacrifice, but he had to die so he could pay for our sins. And he had to go to the grave and he had to raise back again so he could defeat death, hell, and the grave. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father And guess what? He's in the spiritual realm. And now it's given back to us as the ambassadors of Christ to be in the physical realm, to represent a God who people maybe can't see with their eyes or feel with their hands, but they can see you and they can see me. And they're saying, hey, that is the ambassador of a God that is greater than any other God, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. And we are called to live in such a way that we represent him well. But my question is, do we? The church is the flesh and bone to a God who's in the spiritual realm. That's why we are called the bride of Christ. We have been married. The two have become one flesh. And God is looking for a bride that's without spot or wrinkle. And he's saying, can you represent me the way that I've asked you to represent me? You are the physical reality of the presence of God here on church, here in the world, and it's the church. It's not just about me and God. It's about the world in which we live in that is asking for us to live in a way that is outside of ourselves. When people say, I'm about religion, or I'm about relationship, not religion, I'm not religious. It's like a cute way of saying that in 2022 means like, I don't like to follow rules. I like to live for myself. Like I'm all about, it is about relationship, not religion. But when we say that, we have to look at what is the tone in which we're saying that? Because in my understanding, usually the, the, the relationships of the greatest value have the most boundaries. Marriage, there's freedom within marriage, but what has the strictest boundaries? Marriage. The freedom that you get in marriage is unlike any other relationship, but the, the boundaries in which you agree upon are also unlike any other relationship. And when those boundaries are broken, guess what happened? There's distance being created in a relationship that was meant to be together. So God has put a standard in place of how he wants us to live and it's his righteousness and it's the boundaries and the borders to help us be those who live in a way that represents him well. So when we break those boundaries, God's not angry, God's not mean, but what he's saying is you are breaking something that's meant to be together and you're trying to go off and do it on your own. And he says this, he was made to be, he became sin so that we could become his righteousness. The new reality of reconciliation in our communities because it's an invitation to the world to something that's outside of this time and space, which is the righteousness of God. The greatest invitation is that he became so we could become. He became so we could become. He became so we could become. So he is called who we are so we could be called who He is. We are not righteous. He is. We are not good. He is. But in him, we become like who he is. Righteousness is not about doing and not doing. Righteousness is strictly around becoming. This is the thing about salvation. We become the righteousness of God. We are becoming the righteousness of God and we will become the righteousness of God. We were saved. We're being saved and we will be saved. 
So imagine if we as believers took that to heart. He who knew no sin became it, became who we are, not so you could just get into heaven and escape the fires of hell. Fire insurance, right? Well, thank God I missed out on that fire, right? It doesn't say he became sin so that we could become wealthy. Though hopefully that happens. I'm not against it. He didn't say he became sin so we could become just a better person. We could get the 10 rules for life. No, no. He became sin so we could become righteousness. We could become who he is. To represent the world well is to not just have lists of do's and don'ts and just to be someone who acts better and gives, you know, life hacks to people. We're not here to give TED Talks. We are here to tie into the God who became so we can become. And God is a vast, infinite amount of becoming in God. There's no height, nor breadth, nor depth, nor width. You cannot quantify who God is, which means this, that we will never get to the end of becoming who God has called us to be. But imagine for a second that in our lives, in our marriages, in our community, if we were committed to becoming more like Jesus, what kind of invitation that would give to the world of saying, this is something different. The evangelistic gift that God has given you is directly connected to the righteousness that you allow to live through you. We want to win our world for Jesus, then we need to allow the righteousness of Jesus to live through us. We want to win our high school. If we're in high school, we got to allow the righteousness of God to flow through us in college or our workspace. Businessman, I love that we do Bible studies and prayers and things like that, but what is it that we do a Bible study, but we don't actually live it out? You could be in the business world and people could look at you without ever doing a Bible study and be like, what is different? What is, I want an invitation to what you have. And the problem is this, in the Christian world, we teach everyone to be defensive of what they believe. And I'm a Bible college director. I'm all about apologetics. But the greatest apologetics is a life that is transformed. And instead of being on the defensive, we should be in the invitational. Say, come and see. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I guarantee you that the same righteousness that is becoming in me and is is being transformed in me and through me is available to you. And it can change your outlook and it can change your order and it will change your outcome. Not because you've figured out the steps, but because you have connected yourself to the God that became the very thing that is killing you from the inside out, which is your sin. And he says, let me take that punishment. Let me take that pain. Let me take that shame. And let me give you a life of righteousness that you can grow into something way beyond what you ask, think, dream, or imagine that can reach the world for God. And what we need is believers who are saying, I want to be become more like Christ so I can do the ministry of being an ambassador to my world that is lost and hurting and broken. I'm not trying to fast forward to get to heaven. I'm not trying to get to the place where there's no pain or no shame. No, like my God, I'm willing to get in the middle of pain and shame and say, God, redeem this now. Too often we are looking to when we go to heaven. I just can't wait till I go to heaven. I can't wait till God returns. I can't wait till the rapture. I can't wait till this. We need to stop it. We need to live now because if we are so focused on just what's to come, guess what? We are letting people die for eternity while we worry about ours. And an ambassador says, I'm going to represent God the way he would. And he says, I left heaven to come to earth so you could be in heaven with me and I could get heaven into you now. How have we gotten to a place where we live so much for ourselves? That we deny the understanding that God became what we are so we could become who he is. And who he is is he takes those who are enemies and he makes them friends. He takes a world that is lost and hurting and broken and he says, hey, I have created a community that gives you an example so you can have something that's otherworldly.